Father in heaven, we want to thank you that you have been with us in the two classes leading up to this point. We want to thank you that you are our God and that you have put a fire in our hearts and in our bones and in our bellies. We want to be able to share the message of Christ and him crucified and his righteousness with those around us. But Father, we want to be able to do so in a way that is organizationally sound and biblically sound and effective. And Father, most of all, we want to be Christians in our innermost souls. So please, Father, those inconsistencies, those hypocrisies, those um, areas and elements of our lives that are not in perfect harmony with your will, Father, may those things be removed. And Father, if there are those things that we are not aware of, please make us aware of them. And then make us willing to be rid of anything that would put us at cross purposes with you and your will for our lives. Lord, we just want to praise your name. You're so good to us. We could just spend the whole day in praises to you. And Father, in our innermost hearts, we are praising you. So please be with us now as we continue to learn how to preach effectively and persuasively is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we ended our last class talking about a whole bunch of do's, and now we want to talk about just a few don'ts. By all means, don't do the following things. Okay, the first one here is when you're giving a presentation, and this goes along with our slice of bread analogy, okay, as opposed to crumbs, do not digress into areas that plainly don't support the purpose statement. Okay, so you'll sometimes hear preachers say or public communicators say, allow me to digress for a moment. To which I always want to respond, no, permission denied. <laughs> Stay on the point, okay? Um, if, if you are tempted to digress, resist that temptation and stay with the main point, okay? Because remember, often it is the case in preaching that less is more. That less is what, everyone? More. more. And the more you say, the less that people will retain. The less you say, the more that they will retain. So do not digress in areas that don't plainly support the purpose statement. Also, uh, by way of extension, do not preach two or three sermons in one. And as I mentioned, this is a common mistake made by people who don't get to preach very often. They often have so many things that they want to say that they try to say them all in a single sermon, and this is absolutely counterproductive. If you preach a persuasive, beautiful, profound, biblically sound sermon, you will be invited to preach again. But if you preach a run-on sentence sermon that pr that's on every single thing under the sun, don't expect to be invited, ba invited back or to be asked to speak in your local church again if it took an hour and a half to do it. It's just not going to happen. So better, far better to preach a shorter sermon, a single sermon, and not one, two, three, and four sermons, okay? Uh, do not change your mind about what you're going to preach while on the platform. You sometimes hear people do this, and they sort of masquerade it in a kind of quasi-spirituality. And I suppose there are times when it's, it's conceivable, it is possible that God has revealed to a speaker or a, to a presenter at that moment some new thing. And I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. But oftentimes when someone stands up and says, you know, I spent the whole week preparing a sermon on Exodus chapter 3, but just as I was sitting here and I, and I was thinking to myself, God impressed me to preach on fill in the blank. I am very suspicious whenever I hear that because oftentimes that second sermon, I've heard this done numerous times, that's preached is not organized, it's not well put together, and it appears to me at least to sometimes be a cover for a lack of preparation that week. So they're like, you know, I was going to preach on something else, but uh, I decided to preach. No, 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 no. And you say, the Spirit impressed me. Okay, maybe the Spirit did impress you. But my question is, is why didn't the Spirit impress you like on Monday? Why didn't the Spirit impress you on Monday what you were going to preach on Sabbath? The Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, in fact, I think I've got it here. I think I put it in the presentation here. Yes, I did. I'll come right back to that in just a moment. Okay. Here we are. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is, the, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Now look at this. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Now I want to ask you a question. What do you think he means when he writes to his young understudy Timothy, be ready in season and out of season? What's he saying? Always be ready. Okay, always be ready, but even... Okay, what does, what does it mean? Exactly. Sean, you want to add to that? Okay, 
So what would it mean to be in season when it's expected of you? So if you know a month in advance that you're, you've been asked to preach by the pastor or you're going to a, some speaking appointment, you are a month or a week or two weeks in preparation for that appointment. Does that make sense? That's being ready in season. Being ready out of season is when you show up to church and the preacher died uh, the, the night before and now they need somebody to preach and would you please preach? That's being ready out of season. You didn't know and you're just asked on the spot to do something. Or maybe you're at a uh, Vespers gathering and somebody says, uh, Guy Tom, would you share a, a, a brief devotion with us? Uh, sure. So be ready in season and out of season. In season means when you've been asked to preach and you've put preparation, time, energy, effort into that preparation, don't switch it. Don't switch it. Don't switch it at the last minute. If God is impressing you right now to switch it, then why didn't he impress you last week? Okay? And you, I've heard people say some of the strangest things. People say, well, you know, the reason is, is that the devil, if the devil knew starting on Monday what I was going to preach, then he could have kept people from church who would have heard. But now we played, God and I played a trick on the devil. And all the while we thought I was going to preach on Exodus 8. And then boom, he tells me to preach on Deuteronomy chapter 5. Aha, come on. Come on, that's not the devil. You weren't prepared and you're pretending. Now, again, I don't want to say that it's not possible that God could impress but it had better be very, very, very clear to you, okay? You can't sort of, sometimes we mask behind a uh, sort of quasi-spirituality. Oh, yeah, I just feel deeply impressed. Do you feel deeply impressed or were you deeply unprepared? Does that make sense, everyone? So as a general rule, do not change your mind in the last moment about what you're going to preach, okay? Get your mind set on something, spend some time thinking about it, and then start heading in that direction. Start preparing, okay? T. So I was preparing my message at the end of the year right now. And when you said it has to be a New Testament character. <laughs> yeah. So I have to change that? Yeah. Definitely. Or you can find out what your message was, and I can help you to try and ground that in. Because you always have to preach a sermon. And here's why. It's not to be unkind or anything like that. It's very simple. Let's say that I had a sermon. Let's say that I wanted to do a sermon. I'll give you a great example. I'm doing a seminar this year at the GYC. And sometimes they just say, what would you like to preach on? Other times they say, we want a seminar on this. Mm -hmm. So when they asked me this last year, um, the year coming up, what, we want you to do a seminar, but we want it to be on this particular topic. Okay, they're inviting me, they're the inviting party. Now I have the right to say no, mm -hmm. obviously, or I can say, yeah, yeah, I think that's good, that, that we do need a seminar on that, and people aren't talking about that. I'll do it. I can't then come, now that there are stipulations, and then try to preach on something else. You know, the GYC brought me, and I know the advertisement say in the brochure, but I decided to, no, you can't do that. So here, you had an idea in your mind, but you had an idea before you knew the stipulations. Mm -hmm. So take that idea in your mind and either meld it with the stipulations that have been given to you, a New Testament character other than Jesus or Paul, and if you can't do it, then hold on to that and <laughs> preach it at a future venue. But if you can do it, then you can get the best of both worlds. Can you talk sure, absolutely. Yeah, you and somebody else said the same thing. Albert, right? Yeah, I'd love that. Okay, now getting back to the message's content here, this is sometimes, uh, this is a way that you might be tempted to think of your sermon based on what we've been saying here. Primary point, secondary point, and your third point, okay? This is really actually not the way that you should be thinking of your sermon, though, because these are all sort of independent lines pointing to nothing. Far better to have a main point that is then supported by your subpoints, whether it's one, two, three, four, up to five, not more than five, okay? And that way, everything is heading in the same direction, as opposed to being these sort of independent lines. This is a sermon, this is a sermon, this is a sermon. No, this is the main point. So, for example, going back to our one in the Bible, the Bible is trustworthy is your main point. To show that the Bible is trustworthy, and then every corroborating or subpoint demonstrates the trustworthiness of Scripture. The Bible's unique claims, the Bible's unique consistency, the Bible's unique content. Or, let's say the purpose of getting back to our, another Bible study to show that there is a cosmic conflict between heaven and earth, and, or between God and Satan, and that planet earth is its theater. And in examining this, we're going to be looking at the origin of evil, the operations of evil, and the obsolescence of evil. Each one of those supporting your main point. Okay? Making sense, everyone? Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, pressing on here then, uh, by all means, do not present complicated themes unless you are prepared to communicate them in simple terms. Okay, so if you're going to tackle a difficult 
or even a controversial topic, a topic that's difficult. Let's say you're going to conquer genocide in the Old Testament. <laughs> okay, that's a tall order. So be prepared to communicate that. First of all, be aware of the, the size of the task in front of you, number one. Number two, be prepared to communicate it in a way that will not increase but decrease confusion. You want to increase elucidation and decrease obfuscation. In other words, you want to bring light, not darkness. So uh, as a general rule, in the same way that it goes with reading the Bible, you don't typically send a brand new Bible student to Ezekiel. You know, man, I just, I'm been, I gave my life to Jesus and I want to read the Bible and understand it. Where should I go? You know, you should start with Ezekiel. Definitely start in Ezekiel or, or maybe Zechariah. No, not usually. Usually you'll say start in John, start in Mark. Start in um, Genesis. You know, start in a place that's manageable. If you are not accustomed to public communicating, if, if this is going to be a second or a first or a third sermon for you, don't bite off more than you can chew. Right? Take something, a simple truth, with a simple point and a simple Bible character that you can effectively communicate. Okay? Now, there's nothing wrong if somebody wants to try something a little more challenging. Hey, I, I hope you will. I hope you'll push the envelope a little bit and bring something to the table that can really cause us to think and, and get us out of our comfort zones a little bit. I'm super cool with that. But be sure that you're ready to do it. You've got the language right. You, you understand the bigger picture. You're not going to go falling off into um, um, some ditch and, and be in a situation where you are only increasing obfuscation and people's misunderstanding and not increasing elucidation and people's understanding. So just very simply, Rather than tackling something that's very complex and perhaps controversial, um, be prepared to communicate those things in simple terms and start simple and then you can progress to more complex things perhaps later. And finally, do not assume that you're here as no biblical ideas, themes, stories, anecdotes. I'm sometimes guilty of this, but I hear people that are exceedingly guilty of it. In fact, who was it just recently? I was just somewhere recently... You know, it might have been, it might have been your devotion, Michael, that I like so much. Maybe it wasn't that. Anyway, you'll sometimes hear people say things like, we all know the story of Joseph. Right? We all know this hymn. We all know, anytime you say that, if there's somebody there that doesn't know the story of Joseph, or doesn't know this hymn, or doesn't know something that you say everybody should know, they immediately feel like they're on the outside. And this happens in our churches. We'll say, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 18. We're going to be talking about Abraham. We all know the story of Abraham. You can say it so quickly, so innocuously. The problem is, is that if somebody's just in there, they're freshly converted, and they don't know the story of Abraham, you know what you have just told them? You don't belong here. You do not belong here. Because they don't know the story, and everybody that's here does know the story, because they don't. They, this must not be the place for them. So another way of saying those kinds of things is you might say, let's go to a story that's familiar to many of us, the story of Abraham in the Old Testament. Go with me to Genesis chapter 18. Now, most of us probably know the basic parameters of this story, but others maybe not as much. So let's just quickly review. Just be careful of assuming that people know who Lazarus is, know who Paul is, know what the Conflict of the Ages series is, just assume that your congregation, your, your listening audience, does not know things that you think they do. Does that make sense? I've even had people get offended and say, how can you tell us that such and such a book is in the Old Testament? We all know. I'm like, yeah, you wish that everybody knew. I've been in a meeting. I was in a meeting one time. Super fun. I did this just, just for fun. I was meeting with a group of my deacons and uh, elders. And we sat down, and I was like, you know, beloved... This is when I was pastoring. I said, you know, beloved, God has just impressed me with, with a story that I just want to bring your attention to. And um, it's, 